Hello, everybody, and welcome to Inside the Huddle. A new era is born. Uh, so I'm still going to be with Jeff Reinbold on Mondays, but on Thursdays, uh, it is the wonderful Phoebe Schechter from our coverage of the NFL. Phoebe, is that so, you've got some football stuff behind you. That's good. You're working on the football backdrop. <laughs> well, you know what it is? I'm finally at home. So I'm starting to build out my room of football stuff. <laughs> Good. You are not in one place very long. I'm in a hotel in Minneapolis. Uh, so nice. living, living the hotel life, getting ready for uh, Sunday when we're going to cover the um, the Minnesota Vikings taking on the San Francisco 49ers. And uh, so me and Ndomaking Sue will be in the stadium for that one. Then Jay Bell, Phoebe and Olivia will be back in London for the second game. Uh, Cincinnati at Kansas City. We're going to make a few picks, but we're going to, Talk a few headlines and a few bits and pieces first. But Phoebe, before we do that, from a coaching point of view, how important is it now that you settle into the season? You've seen a bit of film from week one, but it's still only week two. But is there a kind of definite difference from week one to week two now? Absolutely. I mean, you got to think first off, for a lot of these athletes, it's, it may be their first time playing in the NFL, especially from a quarterback perspective. Right. You're also starting to see, you know, preseason training camp style stuff there people aren't showing you anything so you've got new offensive new defensive coordinators you want to see what they've brought over from their past teams how they're going to apply it to the new athletes you know we talk a lot about is it player to scheme or scheme to player so you've got some just brand new ideas and week one you kind of test the waters and then week two and you, you start really building and i guess the important thing is not to overreact positively or, or negatively. Uh, I spoke to Thomas Morstead last week, punter for the Jets, and he said, if we go to San Francisco and win, we're going to win the Super Bowl. And if we lose, we suck. And he said, neither are true, actually, um, which is always something to remember. I mean, the Chiefs lost on opening day last year and won the Super Bowl. Yeah, and it's really easy when people see their first, you know, look, I, I put myself out there. I said Green Bay take it all the way. Just because Jordan Love's injured doesn't mean I don't think they can still do it. But that's what the beauty of the NFL is. And I know Jay Bell said it a few times, you know, the first three to four weeks of the season aren't a realistic picture of who these NFL teams are. Right. You've got to get kind of over that first month, over that hump. And then you start to really see who these teams are because you've got the continuity. We saw throughout the preseason, I'm sure we'll talk about it a little bit later, you know, some athletes weren't playing. You don't get that consistency of quarterback or senior, for example bit like us on this Thursday podcast. It's going to take... I, exactly. Oh, <laughs> there and scheme. we got to get it all aligned. <laughs> yes, this is our first rodeo, you know. <laughs> sure, it's not the first time I've asked you a question or two, though, so we'll be fine. <laughs> <laughs> um, let's talk a little bit of news. Not too much, but obviously the Tyreek Hill body cam footage has, has emerged now. So, of course, the Miami Dolphins wide receiver was uh, stopped for a traffic violation, speeding, not wearing his seatbelt, one block from the stadium, uh, on Sunday ahead of the win against the Jacksonville Jaguars. Things escalated very quickly, Phoebe. Tyreek has since said he could have been better in that situation, but he also said there was no excuse for them to beat on him. Uh, I mean, it did escalate. He was laying face down in the street. Calais Campbell, NFL Man of the Year, and possibly the nicest man in the NFL, also ended up in handcuffs. Um, what did you think of the footage, first of all, and then Tyreek's reaction? Well, I think kind of going to what you initially said, I think both things are true, right? There was that Tyreek probably could have been better, but also it was completely unnecessary for for <laughs> Campbell to end up in, in handcuffs, for Tyreek to be treated the way he was on the ground like that. And I think one of the things that was super important to hear was Tyreek said, if it wasn't me, if it wasn't Tyreek Hill, what could that have been? And it's absolutely true. And it's unfortunately a conversation that's been going on for years. And it's not just in the US, it's in the UK and all over the world, honestly, about that relationship with the police. And so I think what they want to do off the back of this is use this as a great platform to kind of educate and build awareness. But watching it, I mean, the fact that the that the Miami Dolphins were able to go and play that game and do what they did with all that in your mind for the average person. Right. You'd you be so not be able to put... Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> I thought... Um... Calais Campbell made a good point afterwards as well. If you watch the footage and you see various angles, Calais Campbell approaches the police officer literally like this, like already yeah. in a kind of defensive position. And he said afterwards, he said, is 
his family sort of taught him at a young age that because you're a big man, you've got to not look threatening. And I think that's the biggest takeaway, isn't it? That what if this hadn't been superstars of the NFL? I, I you, you worry about when I'm sure that stuff happens time and time again. So it's a good reminder to us all, I think. Um, let's move on then. Uh, the Miami Dolphins will be playing the Buffalo Bills in week two. We'll talk about that in a little, but, little while. But we're going to do a little segment on Thursdays. What we've noticed, because one of the great things about after, you know, now we've got a few days since the games have been played, all sorts of things pop up on, on social media that are worth looking at, worth discussing, even though they are not official news releases and press releases. and But they tell us a story sometimes. So let's talk about a couple of things we've noticed. Phoebe, you want to kick us off with it? Yeah, absolutely. So what I would love to bring to the table, and we, I think, you know, it was a game that we covered as well, the Browns game versus hey. Cowboys. And one of the things that actually you brought to my attention, I must say, we'd seen throughout the game that obviously things are not great with Sean Watson, bad body language. You right. could see almost the huddle that the players were not coming together. But what really just made it all click was when you had sent me the clip of Joe Batonio, offensive lineman, Literally, Neil and I first thing we said is this is the nicest man that either of us have ever met. I mean, O-line tend to be gentle giants, big teddy bears. But when he was on the floor, Sean Watson went to reach his hand out and he actually waved him off. I mean, this could not be any more clear of a sign that things are not good with the Browns. Yeah, and because Joel is such a nice guy, he's tried to put the uh, the rabbit back in the hat, so to speak. He said, well, I'm too big to help up and... Me and Deshaun were fine, but look, I think the first reaction was a was a very obvious one. And and Phoebe Deshaun Watson facing more allegations from from years past. Obviously, he's already had a lot of uh, legal issues. Um, yeah, you know, it's just another cloud that hangs over this team, and it is always going to be the backdrop of how he plays. Because, like you you pointed out before, we have to wonder what players in that locker room really think about him. That's just a fact. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, they're still humans. We don't always like the people that we work with, right? right. I mean, you you work with them, but it doesn't mean that you have to get on. You be professional. Hang on. Um, what which is what me? makes like. What are you telling <laughs> me? No, no, no. We're tight. We're tight. This is not the platform to tell me this now. <laughs> Freaking news. Yeah, no, you're <laughs> right. Though. I mean, especially with the locker room with so many people in there. <laughs> yeah, hugely. And one of the things that's kind of come out with this newest, you know issue with with Deshaun Watson is actually when the Browns took him on there was nothing they could do about the past stuff right but right. because this is new because this is 2020 whilst he's been with the Browns this could eventually mean that actually this could be a get out of get out of like contract situation right. for the Browns and Deshaun Watson so maybe this is like handing an olive branch out from the NFL saying look you guys could end this here yeah, they can void the last couple of years of his contract if some of these allegations prove to be true. Um, I noticed, of course, Joe Burrow with the Cincinnati Bengals, and he's addressed this as well. The the part that a lot of people are talking about on social media is how he picks up the water bottle and drinks from it. And he said, I'm just drinking from a water bottle. But if you watch the video before that, he's rotating his wrist time and time again. He's putting his wrist up and down. Of course, his season was ended last year with a wrist injury. So... I'm not so concerned about the water bottle, but Phoebe, I am worried about whether it's mentally in Joe Burrow's head or if it is actually giving him some discomfort because that is his throwing hand. Yeah, and I'll be honest, I pick up a water bottle the same way, um, so I, I can't really judge him on that. But I agree. I mean, it is concerning because when you've got something, first off, it just shows it's on his mind. Even if it's not hurting him, yeah. you know, which we do or don't know, when you're constantly kind of playing with it like that, reverting back to it subconsciously, that's almost more of it. Like you're not trusting what your body is is doing or what it's telling you. So I'd be interested to see, and especially, you know, we talked about quarterbacks and receivers who haven't had much relationship in this off right. season. You know, Jamar Chase had been practicing. You have no T Higgins there. So I'm keen to see when he starts really having to throw like more of those sharper footballs as well, where there's more like wrist action. What does that mean for him? Uh, I'm going to throw in a bonus one. Uh, Dave Canales, the head coach of the Carolina Panthers, says he's already had a meeting with David Tepper and that he's being offered a lot of support. Uh, the Panthers lost 47-10 on Sunday. Tepper's fired coaches in each of the last two seasons. So, uh, yeah, pray for Dave Canales. Yeah, so what is the support? <laughs> yes, exactly. Do it now. <laughs> yes. Um, 
We're also going to look at what's on our radar uh, every Thursday. So this isn't something that might necessarily relate to this weekend coming, but it might just be something that, okay, I'm on notice. I'm looking at this. I want to see how it plays out. What have you got for us, peeps? So I was actually going to bring up the Atlanta Falcons offensive line. I'm They're on my radar because they came in as one of the only starting offensive lines that's been the same from last year to this year. There was so much hope and promise for them. And we watched that first game. I, you know, I know it's everyone's first game of the season, but they were supposed to be the strength of that team, essentially. And for me, it was very concerning to see that they weren't able to pretty much stop anything. Kirk Cousins being hit multitude of times. It was it was alarming. They did not look like the starting five that we saw last year. I think what I about saw- you? Yes, well, I think I saw a stat, first of all, on that, that each of those linemen gave up at least two pressures. So that's disturbing. But my one, you won't be surprised, uh, is stats related. I so, love that. <laughs> on my radar is the fact there were 34 touchdown passes in week one. That's only just over one per team. So to compare, in 2021, there were 61. 2022, 51. Then 2023, last year, there were 37 and now 34. There are only two 300-yard passes, two at Tonga Vailoa and Matthew Stafford. So is this the week one rustiness? But I'm also thinking bigger pitch or are... I've got so many layers to this. Are offensive lines worse? Are, are, are game wreckers more prominent, like pass rushers? Because we haven't seen a 50-touchdown pass quarterback for a while either last year Dak Prescott led the NFL with 36 so is it preseason or are defenses generally catching up do you have a thought well okay so I think there's a few different things to a that one, wasn't it? I think okay. one I know I'm like I gotta use my memory here um <laughs> I think I think that genuinely we have a lot of younger quarterbacks starting yes I think last year was the number one year of like the youngest quarterbacks um since 2012 I want to say if that's I mean wrong yeah, perfect. So I just think that's, say it. Just say it. <laughs> just confidence, confidence. Since since uh, RG three and and they were in the league. Yes. But honestly, it was. I think there's an element of that. So you don't have that same level. I think absolutely the way that these defenses have, are playing, they are able to attack in such different ways. I mean, again, kind of talking about our game with with the Steelers, like TJ Watt destroyed that whole game. Right. Yeah. And not only that, you've got such athletic DBs out there nowadays that, you know, even if you do have an explosive play, the speed of these defensive players to run and chase it down. So you end up in a situation where actually you have to, you know, kind of like a Lamar and Derrick Henry situation, you might get all the way down the field, but you need that running back to punch it in with those touchdowns. So I think there's a, I think there's a bunch of different layers to that. And I think it's such a great point to bring up. I think defenses generally are a lot more athletic. I can remember watching as a young fan in the 80s, and if there was a wide receiver reverse, it would often go for a touchdown. Now, yeah. they, they, those are uh, first of all, they run a lot more, so defenses are ready for it more, but they're also, those kind of plays are shut down a lot more. Yeah, they are. There's so much, like, the discipline is so much better. And I think also we're in an age where, almost every defense has some version of a spy or someone like that on the quarterback, which it didn't, we didn't used to have such a high like running quarterback league, but I think that makes a difference because perhaps in the past, a quarterback could have scrambled, extended a play and made a big pass downfield. I think now because of the just football IQ and the athleticism, you've got a lot less of that ability. I think it, Defenses always find a way to catch up. These things go in cycles. Peyton Manning throws for 55 touchdowns. Defenses are going to find a way to adjust. Maybe that's that's what we're seeing. But yeah, 34 uh, in week Crazy. one. So we'll keep an eye on that. Let's move ahead to week two then. Uh, we're not going to go through every game, but we've selected a few that we like. And then we're going to pick the three games that are on Sky on Sunday night. So we've got to start with uh, Thursday night football. And if you're listening on Friday, then apologies. But it's your Buffalo Bills against my Miami Dolphins. And, well, your, your Bills own the Dolphins. Josh Allen is 11-2 and two, uh, versus Miami. And actually, Buffalo is 6-0 and oh on a Thursday when Josh Allen plays. So this bodes well. I mean, when the lights are on, the stars shine bright. I mean, Josh Allen is, he is the show. I'm sorry. We watched the game Sunday, last yeah. week. Yeah. Unbelievable. I mean, that was the first game of the season. 
hopefully he doesn't have to do so many acrobatics and literal hurdling into the end zones. However, he makes things happen. It was great to see Keon Coleman getting used the way yeah. he was. The running game mixed in. That's what we're looking forward to with Joe Brady being his kind of first full year as an offensive coordinator. Um, and then again, Bobby Babbage calling the defense. I, I still have concerns over the defense in the sense this, this week, Taron Johnson is out, who is their starting nickel. I mean, he is ferocious and he's a he's one of the most probably long-term defensive players they have left on that team. Right. I think um I think Josh Allen as well. People sometimes say, Well, is it sustainable to do that leaping over? He hurt his left hand, but he's been cleared to play in this game. But that's been Josh Allen ever since he's entered the NFL. There's no point changing it now. Why would you? He took that team and dragged them to victory. Um, we're not picking this one, but I'm quietly confident about the Dolphins because I feel like they had some defensive showings uh, against Jacksonville, and I believe that offense should wake up. This is going to be a good one. Oh, this is going to be incredible, and I, I really want to see that offense just take off from the beginning. Yeah. They have that ability. We've seen them do it before against Buffalo. They're at home. They always have their little tricks how to make other teams feel the heat and the sunshine, even at that hour. Yeah, I mean, it will be hot. It will be hot. Look, we yeah. won't pick this one. But next time no. we're in London and we meet up, the loser buys coffee, okay? I totally agree with that. <laughs> we're not teaching it. But That's a there's, good deal. There's a little deal. <laughs> um, fascinating game in Detroit. So for the second week in a row, Detroit are going to play teams that they beat in last year's playoffs. They opened with the Rams. Now it's Tampa Bay at Detroit. Um, this was an NFC divisional round matchup uh, last year. Detroit won 31-23. Baker Mayfield kind of gave them all they could handle last year, Phoebe, and he's leading the quarterbacks this year already with four touchdown passes and a rating of 146.4. That's a story just worth monitoring because the, the Baker redemption story is something that we should all be rejoicing in, I think. I mean, hugely. I think it was the Tampa Bay and the Saints with the highest EPA of week one, which no one would ever imagine. No. <laughs> that. It's just crazy the world we're living in. But what a game this is going to be because I can't wait to see what Baker Mayfield does against this Lions defense. It's a more fully stacked defense, I would say. But seeing the relationship that they have, Baker year two with Tampa Bay, in terms of his relationship with Mike Evans, I mean, that just stood up time and time again. Mike Evans it has not missed a beat I just think that they could be incredibly dangerous and they might even be able to like take this one over with the Lions. Yeah, the Lions certainly, Dan Campbell said, we're going to get everyone's best punch. And that was what they got on Sunday from the Rams. It was quite big that they emerged and dug deep and won that game late because they're going to have to do it week in and week. We, I think we're already going to see in the first couple of weeks exactly what Dan Campbell said is that every game is going to be like a mini Super Bowl. Now, Maybe that has a cumulative effect on the Lions as they go deeper into the season. Um, but we're going to find out about his team, um, certainly with games like this, games like last weekend. Yeah, hugely. I mean, and even the game against the Rams, a lot of that was the Rams just lost so many players it, to injury throughout that. So you wonder if you had a healthy Rams, could they have? Could the Lions have sustained that kind of drive and success throughout I think that the biggest thing is going to be for the, the Lions defense really to be able to contain, which sounds crazy to say, contain Baker Mayfield and and his weapons, but they've been just incredible. And so, I mean, week two, like you never know what could happen, but I really do think this is going to be such an exciting game. Is Baker the same quarterback physically? Has he changed? Is it Has, he, has his transformation been more mental and being in a better situation? I think there's a bit of both mixed in there. I mm. think first off, when you, you know, we talked about it oddly enough with um, the Lions, when you know a team wants you there, you, your mental status already changes, right? It's not, it's not being content, but you're in a spot where you actually feel like, hey, these guys believe in me. And when sometimes when someone believes in you, that just gives you enough. So I feel like Mentally, his his football IQ is getting better. I mean, he has always had those abil that ability to kind of just get these throws out there that you're kind of like, oh, Baker, <laughs> a little bit like Gardner Minshew does, right? right? I mean, they have that same kind of unexpected ceiling at times where you think, oh, wow, this this is why they drafted you. But I think he's happy. He's got a great play caller around him, understands him, his strengths. And again, just that that continuity, consistency from 
back to back years now um, with, you know, offensive weapons that he's comfortable with. Yeah, Mike Evans will right a lot of wrongs. We should keep a count on this, by the way, on our show on Sundays during the season. I have a red zone update blind spot and it's Gardner Minshew and Baker Mayfield. And I already <laughs> did it. I already did it once on Sunday. I think I might have done it two or three times last year. I just see them as the same person. Now they're not. I think Baker's a much more polished version. But I get yes. them two mixed up all the time. I know what you mean. Like they have the same kind of style about them yeah. and like way of play. So it's um so yeah, I, I hear that. It's easy to kind of confuse the two. <laughs> I think we'll get a little bell or something. So every time I say it in the studio, you can just ring the bell. It's like, yeah. <laughs> okay. um, um, this this is not really a banner matchup. I want to talk about the kind of aspects around these teams. So Cleveland at Jacksonville, I think is very mm -hmm. interesting because Cleveland were, we saw it, it was painful. It was absolutely yeah. dismal. Losing 33-14 at home. Jacksonville had in the second half of that game against Miami, a 90% win percentage chance, which was going to go north of that if Travis Etienne gets into the end zone. He fumbles, Miami recover, the goal near the, in the end zone. They score the other way and the game's on. Jacksonville didn't score a point in the second half. So when you're really, really disappointed and you've been in the locker rooms, you've been around these NFL players, is it a case that they just can't wait to get back out on the field? Should we expect a bounce back from one of these teams, given how disappointed they would have been in week one? Yeah, and I feel like the bounce back would probably come more from the Jacksonville Jaguars. I think right. this is really an opportunity for them to showcase, hey, look, that was not our best game. We are a much better outfit than that. And let me put that on paper. I, my concern sometimes is that they play down to some of the teams that they are playing against. And right. if you know, we get a repeat of the Browns we just saw, you know, what version of Jacksonville will we get? But I think Trevor Lawrence is very desperate to prove to people that, you know, he's on his third year, like he he can do this. You know, he's no longer really that rookie that we've talked about for so long. You know, he's certainly a veteran and a, a leader. And, you know, he's discussed his different leadership styles that it's not your rah-rah, but I think that calm, cool collectedness against, you know, Miles Garrett and the defense that they're going to be showing him is going to be imperative. I asked you in the pregame show on Sunday in the studio whether finishing is just a, a thing coaches talk about or if it's actually a tangible thing because when I went to Jacksonville, Doug Peterson talked about it as well. Remember the Jags lost five of their last six. Mike McDaniel talked about it. But it is a real thing. Like you said it was. You said you can coach it and you can teach that and embed it in your players. If Travis Etienne finishes that run, squeezing the ball tight and making sure he gets in the end zone, or at the very least, and the very worst, down at the one-yard line, Jacksonville will probably 1-0 right now. Yeah, and and that's going to be the conversation, right? Because you can, a lot of times in NFL classrooms, locker rooms, whatever you want to talk, you, you showcase things like that. Like, yes, you show the good because you want to encourage that, but you show this is the difference between winning and losing. And the difference is the little details, doing the right thing. So you start to kind of create that narrative about how we need to finish. And, you know, perhaps they'll do more on the ground drills because we also have to remember week one showcases that these guys haven't played a game since December, right? Yeah. Ultimately. Play fundamentally, you think? I, absolutely. Because it doesn't matter how many times in practice, hey, high and tight, we're hitting your hands at this. When you have hundreds of pounds of humans on you trying to rip the ball out like that muscle memory might be there but the strength is not quite there because you've just not done it for six months it's almost same with tackling that's why tackling is such a big issue they literally do pretty much no tackling from the last time they've done their game full tackling unless you're with like the Steelers or a right. team like that when do, when do you think we see the the kind of true NFL then from the start of October does it take a good few weeks I think it absolutely takes a few weeks. I think you're looking at October because also, and, and again, Jason J. Bell says it himself, like everybody's playing at a different speed these first couple of weeks. And then you start getting into, all right, settle. We need to now think about longevity, building ourselves. But I mean, genuinely the angles, the speeds, I mean, and we've talked about it in the past about, hey, you're Tyree Kills. Now you're Xavier Worthy. It's like, how do I defend and attack at certain angles that speed? So you've got to adjust yourself when you've not, if you don't have a guy like that on your team, you've right. only been practicing against one level of speed. Well, when it hits you in a game, you're like, 
oh no, this is not right. I gotta yeah. go. <laughs> your ankles roll off. Yeah, and you, yeah, we, we saw that with the the Tyreek Hill touchdown. Andre Cisco just took the slightly wrong angle based purely off speed. That's one of the best safeties in the NFL. Um, let's pick the let's pick our games then on Sunday. So we've got three games on Sunday, starting with San Francisco at Minnesota. We're waiting to see if Christian McCaffrey plays, but the 49ers just well, this is a this is a Shanahan thing. It was Mike Shanahan back in the day with Denver. It's a Kyle Shanahan thing. You can plug somebody else in there. Jordan Mason had 28 carries, 147 yards, and a touchdown. I guess the only concern for San Francisco in the win against the Jets was six field goals and just two touchdowns. But I'm leaning towards San Francisco here just because Minnesota's defense had a nice day, but it was Daniel Jones and the Giants. Yeah. Yeah, it's not really a, a true test of that defense, for example. And I think, I mean, I, I wasn't talking about, as much about the 49ers coming into this season, but Jordan Mason, I mean, I'm undrafted free agent. They've, they've been there for a couple of years. He was phenomenal. It's it's like Shanahan saying, yeah, we don't have McCaffrey, but here's our next guy. And our next guy is going to beat you. And our next guy is going to beat you. Some of the blocking schemes that I saw, I mean, I love what they were able to do, the ways that they attack. And they're probably one of the best blocking teams I know it's not like something to be proud of necessarily as a receiver you want to be out there catching a football but you know are you kiddle those guys were, were incessant I think that's the thing where you can certainly see it from a coach's eye um when we talk about Kyle Shanahan and we we talk about his attacks we're like look at this receiver running in space and look how he dials up this for Purdy and but the 49ers have had that running game traditionally has always been there, hasn't it? And actually, Mike McDaniel, who's an offshoot of Kyle Shanahan, would love to run the ball first in Miami, even though they've got Tyreek Hill and Jalen Waddle. Um, it's probably a part of it that we may be, from the outside, a bit guilty of not looking at as much, the intricacy of the blocking. Yeah, and I think that's because it's not, it's not like a cute thing to look at, right? People aren't like, wow, look at the way that that offensive <laughs> lineman or, right. you know, that they climbed up to that second level and got the linebackers. It's just not something that you see. You see the end result and it kind of looks a bit sloppy in the middle sometimes. But when right. you see a nicely drawn out blocking scheme and you see it come to life, I mean, it's it's beautiful genuinely because you think how much they get it. It's all about angles and understanding what defensive front they're in, which means they know who they're climbing to and all the lingo amongst the offensive line, like that's the beauty of the sport. So it doesn't necessarily come across. You're just like, oh, hey, that run gained six yards or seven yards. But genuinely, it is beautiful. <laughs> uh, I was pleased Sam Darnold backed me up. He had a good good first day for the Vikings. But again, I think this 49ers defense uh, is a completely different level. I'm going 49ers to win on the road. What about you, Phoebe? Yeah, I'm going to have to go 49ers as well. I think they're going to challenge Sam Darnold for sure. Yeah, so that one kicks off at 6 o'clock. We're on air from US Bank Stadium from 5. Then at 9.25, it's Cincinnati at Kansas City. It's actually the first meeting of Mahomes and Joe Burrow since the 2022 season's AFC Championship game. Burrow is 3-1 and one, uh, against Mahomes head-to-head, -head, but Mahomes is 16-4 uh, and four in September. And I guess the whole backdrop for me, I want to, I want to know... How is Joe Burrow and these Bengals, they're notorious slow starters. He's now one and four as an NFL starter in week one. Yeah, and I really don't believe that they are even close to being where they need to be to be playing against this Chiefs. I mean, this in theory would be such a great game, but I'd love to see this game, you know, later on, maybe yeah. in an AFC championship game. I think it's a totally different bag of worms there. So I think that, I think that, not having that that relationship with Chase in the preseason, it looks like they haven't. I think not having Higgins around, I mean, T Higgins is a big part of that offense and, you know, they're dealing with contract issues and whatnot. So, yeah, I, I and honestly, I was kind of shocked by the defense, a defense who I felt had been so strong in the past. I feel like they really let them down. So now you've got to look at Xavier Worthy, you've got to look at Isaiah Pacheco, who is going to want to run all over them. I don't know if I trust the Bengals right now who they are to be able to to beat Mahomes and the Chiefs. And they didn't really have an. This is actually what they didn't really have an answer from Ramondre Stevenson of the Patriots, and yet we probably all thought that's New England's only weapon. I mean, the Patriots were the only team in Week One didn't have an offensive player over twenty yards, but the Bengals couldn't stop the run. So I'm I worry for them. This should be 
a classic, but I think the Chiefs are going to win pretty comfortably. Also, just to your point you just made, I know the NFL needs to come back with a bang, but I would this one I could have seen in November. Baltimore, Kansas City, I'd have loved to have seen in December. I feel like, you know, already Kansas City have got the tiebreak over Baltimore and we're barely out of training camp. I know. And honestly, that game, that game was good. The first half of the Chiefs Ravens games, I mean, that was almost a slow starter for both of them. It wasn't, it was like the second half were, were teams that looked like they've been playing for a few weeks then. So to be able to come that close to it, I mean, that could have gone any way. I know we joke about it, but literally right. a game of inches. Yeah. That was, I thought it was great the second half. <laughs> Overlooked as well was that John Harbour put up the two. They were going to win it. They weren't going to kick oh, the yeah. extra point. We would have loved to have seen that. Um, so you're going Chiefs to win by the sounds of it? I am, yes. <laughs> All right. And then Sunday night football uh, is two very uh, exciting young passers uh, in uh, the Chicago Bears, led by Caleb Williams, and the Houston Texans, led by CJ Stroud. But Caleb had 93 passing yards, Phoebe in his NFL debut. We'll get to the Texans in a second, but the only points he accounted for was like the two point conversion. Um, he would not, he won't, won't mind that he got the win, but he would not have dreamt of those kind of numbers. And yeah. What, what, what was the issue? Do you think? Yeah. I mean, uh, just a, a, a uniquely historic win for yeah. the Bears. <laughs> I mean, pretty, yeah, pretty impressive to y'all to, to bring that back like that. But I just think that, when you're a rookie quarterback coming into the league, it doesn't matter how hyped up you are from college or what you've done the, in the preseason, defensive coordinators are going to come for you. Right. And they are going to show you different things. They're going to make you doubt yourself. And it just felt like he, he normally, he's so evasive and quick and making yep. those decisions and able to put the ball anywhere. But it, the defense just kind of changed what he was seeing. And I think when you start doubting yourself, that's where you're like, Ooh, okay, this is real. We're in the NFL now. <laughs> well, yeah, you, can, you can scramble a figure of eight in the backfield against somebody who will be selling car insurance in two years' time in college. You can't do that in the NFL, and that's maybe what they have to learn. I think maybe he knew there was so much attention on him. You know, the whole – probably if you look at quarterback arrivals, it was Trevor Lawrence – uh, before Caleb Williams, before that, it was probably Andrew Luck. So his arrival has been so eagerly awaited. He knows that. And I think yeah. he may have been, maybe was a bit amped up. He missed a couple of throws down the sidelines that could have been touchdowns that he'd won back. So he'll just be glad to get that one under the belt and then move on against a Houston team that actually gave up some, we'll talk about their offense in a second, but they gave up some big plays to the Colts. Yeah, they absolutely did. And I mean, look, it was also great to see Richardson back for the Colts, something that we've been looking forward to. He brings such a different level of, I mean, his arm strength, which is phenomenal. I mean, that scramble he had and then throwing off his back foot like that, that was mind blowing, to be honest, and just a, a great taste of having him back. But they did. No, they absolutely did. I mean, their physical team, Jonathan Taylor's a physical element to bring to the, to the table and Defensively, they struggled a little bit. I think it's not necessarily going to be the same versus Chicago. I think that they've got a much better defensive set to go against what they're able to offer. Um, I think I think the thing is, it's interesting to have these two quarterbacks playing, right? Because CJ Stroud, who ultimately changed the way people saw rookie quarterbacks, and then Caleb Williams, who they thought would just be the next CJ Stroud and would come in and dominate. And it's just two total different entrances into the NFL. Uh, CJ Stroud's got a lot of weapons around him now. Um, and it's interesting because I assume when your coach is in the NFL, you you bring somebody in through free agency or the draft and you say, well, we think this guy's going to be great. But you don't always know. And actually free agents especially don't always pan out. But that was a really good day for the Texans then last week because Joe Mixon carries 30 times 159 yards and a touchdown and Stefan Diggs didn't have huge yardage but scored two touchdowns including one on fourth and goal so you know those already they're patting themselves on the back in Houston about the start of those two guys hugely and and Stefan Diggs just brings a different swagger as well and I think he really fits that kind of Houston Texans mentality right. and a little bit of veteran experience right especially from him coming from being with Buffalo with Josh Allen, he's used to that kind of quarterback who can move around. I mean, he's wanted to be the number one guy for a while now. So I think he's excited to keep building that relationship with CJ Stroud, having Tank Dell back. I mean, it was just great to see that combination. And 
truthfully, like you were saying, Joe Mixon, having him out there, mm -hmm. the way that the Texans ran the ball, I mean, they averaged more yards in that game than they did their entire season last year. Right. So, I mean, it just goes to show how great it was to see the run game being such a prominent part of their offense. All right. Good stuff. You're picking, I'm picking Houston. Who are you picking? I almost forgot to ask you then. I'm going to Houston. <laughs> I'm, I am going Houston as well. I feel like we've had a lot of similar, but I think this right. early in the year, Clearly. things are a little, a little bit clearer for us. But yeah. don't worry, we will be we will be competing later on. We'll be arguing like cats and dogs by the end of the year. <laughs> um, I've got to be professional later today because I'm going across the road from my hotel uh, to interview Sam Donald. So <gasps> right, and now I'm a huge Sam Donald fan. I've got to be careful not yes. to just hug him, you know. I know. I mean, I, I feel like he'd be up for it. He, he's, he seems like the hugging kind of guy. Just I'll try like, one of those kind of awkward hug. I've hug never evening. met him. Normally, I'll hug, a, I'll hug an NFL player if I know them. I feel like yeah. if I give Sam a big hug right out the gate, it might. My You're going to start with a handshake and then finish with a hug? Yeah. What are the, yeah, if it goes well. You can do that. I can then you'd be like, yeah. I love what you've done. Thank you. I appreciate <laughs> it. I appreciate it. Um, right. So we're on it. I don't know how to say goodbye now because Jeff normally says goodbye. Um, but oh. we're going to have to come up with our own Thursday goodbye. But we're on air five well. o'clock uh, from US Bank Stadium uh, on Sunday. Then the second game will be from our London studios. Um, so, yeah, everyone enjoy week two. And I guess say goodbye to everyone, Phoebe. <laughs> See you guys Bye. later. <laughs> Bye.